you know, the original plan was that I would read all these letters when I was 18 or when I was old enough to comprehend. But, you know, me being me and being curious, if my parents would go to the shop or something, I knew where the letters were. So I'd just go read them anyway. How do you not look at her stomach and think, oh my God, I was in there? Because for me, that concept is alien to me. Mm -hmm. I can't even conceptualize that. I do regret reading them as young as I did. But I do think it was necessary for me to have read them and not waited till I was 18. Say this. If you are a foster parent and you are not sad when the child leaves, you're not doing it right. Every time a child left, it was painful for me. But it's not about me. It's, I've seen social workers crying. You know, mm. like really upset that they've not been able to argue their case in court, that that house is not safe. And they have to take that child in a car, knowing that that child, they might get caught saying that child's died. Heard the words, oh, you really look like so-and-so. And when you're adopted, you dream of hearing that one day because you've just never had it. So they'd say, so their, their, their parents didn't want them then. Yeah, and the child are really vulgar. She wouldn't touch her belly because she believed that she was transferring evil onto me. Um, she cleared out all the furniture in our apartment, set it alight in the middle of the street because she was cleansing the air. New questions every day. How's a brother supposed to sleep? Listen, I give youngers books. Trying to educate myself as I'm running through these streets. There's no such thing as black and black crime. You can hit us in the DMs if you want the smoke. Pew, pew, pew. Not sure where the conversation's gonna go. Too far to lie. Did you do your research? Yeah, I wanna know. That's the life of a domino. It's a domino, domino offense. <laughs> <laughs> So what's this guy doing? <laughs> a little smoke screen to start off, do you know what I mean? Um, thank you. Welcome, welcome, guys. Hello. Farewell. See you back for a second time. Yes, thanks for having Couldn't me back. Stay away. Love the Seemingly so. Mm -hmm. Can I say? Yeah, people were calling you out on the TikTok, but like, ah, oh, this girl, she listens to too much Jordan Peterson. I know, I was really sad. <laughs> I just wanted to share the love of Jordan Peterson. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Like people are going in, but to us, we get dragged all the time. Cool. But you took it like a champ because a lot of people, when they come on, they're like, oh, like, I feel like you lot didn't protect us the way people go. And that's in the comments. And we're like, we can't even protect us. I came ourselves. in at my own will. <laughs> huh? I came in at my own will and I learned my lesson. I prepared too much last time, thought too much about what I wanted to say. So this time I've come in as myself and mm. we'll see what happens. I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. I think people prepare too little when they have these conversations. And then when they get dragged, they're like, why but <laughs> at least you've done your ed you study and you know what you're talking about then you can you can stand by what you say yeah it's all a learning process you know the more i do these things the better i'm gonna get at exactly articulating what i want to say yeah when we first started we used to get dragged <laughs> oh my god but then, but then when, we, when we look back we're just like okay maybe Fair point. certain aspects yeah we'll be in one-sided yeah mm -hmm. even like I was, talk I was talking to eds about this like before i had an idea of what sex workers would be like what was like and it's almost like I saw you as your your character is deplorable if you worked in that line of work. But then when you actually delve deeper into their story, it's almost like mm. if I lived your life, maybe yeah. I, could, I could have been doing the same thing. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's, I always stand by what I say. Mm. That's it. We we go by the saying: if you believe it and you can defend it, then you should say it. Yeah. But at the same time, I also had to to learn that how you say certain things will be, be problematic, not what you say. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I learned that, but I was like, fuck it, and I'll say what I want. <laughs> Come for me, innit? For me, it's more of like, I still stand on what I'm saying. I still, like, if I believe in a message, I'll still say it in that style, but my actual opinion has changed. It's it's more of a gray area than black and white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, before, like, before coming to bed, if you're this kind of person, you do this, 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 where now it's less good and bad, it's more, there's just decisions. It's good to change your mind. Yeah, but yeah. You have to remain open-minded, especially as a podcaster. And with the type of platform we look to create, it is a place where, like you said, it creates that domino effect to allow people to start thinking about things in different ways. So if we don't change the way we think, how can we persuade other people to change or question what they think? It's a difference between being an ideologue and being um, open-minded that you can, when the facts present themselves, that you can look at that and then change your mind. Mm -hmm. The facts are presented to you and you're still like, nah, I have, I'm, I'm wedded I'm to I'm standing this. by what I believe. Yeah. Then it's an ideology. Yeah, 100%. I want to think thank you for um reaching out to us. Uh, we always say to people that um we have conversations with anyone that so we just say we always said and we've said it before we always have to repeat for the people that don't always tune in. Don't just hit us up on the, the email or, just, or on DMs and say, yo, bro, we've got knowledge to spread. Like, <laughs> could you, like, give us an idea. Like, the way you yeah. broke it down is, 
this is my experience. I do this, this, and this. This is what I think I can bring to the platform, and this is why it's interesting. And yeah, from the from straight off, we were like, yeah, let's just get it booked in. Um, but that leads us into today. But before we get into the topic and the intros, if you just say who you are to the cameras that people haven't seen before, give you a little wave. My name is Christine. Um, yeah, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name's Mahela. Hello, um, and I'm a an adopter. To my left, we got a plant-based warrior, the vegan dickhead, <laughs> Burner Boy from Wish. Come on, yeah, you, 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 you. He took Burner Boy. <laughs> you already know the stars. We're here. We're Edicus, here. We're here. AKA Eds. Come on. And we got me, the most masculine host of the pod. Don't let him gas you. <laughs> this guy lies his height on social platforms. Well, you got you got the Air Forces today. Bro, right, always. Yeah. They come like high heels. Extra platforms. Yeah. <laughs> five nine, five ten. Everything's Wait. fake. His hat, his hairline, his teeth. <laughs> Invest, man. Yeah. Invest Mr. Himself. Masculine over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that brings us in today. Without further ado. Let's get ready to dominate. Come on, we're back again. He's not the <laughs> They took it quite well, she's like, hmm. <laughs> But listen, we're back again for another fantastic panel. Yeah, we love all the support across the platform. We've actually hit over a million views now, mm -hmm. so we're doing quite well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 5k subs, TikTok's growing nicely. So, you a lot of showing support, but we could always have more. What is what is the what are analytics saying? It's funny because the views have been increasing, but the subscribers, the ratio wise, have been decreasing. So, I was checking the analytics, and we've gone from 75% of our regular listeners are subscribed to actually 93. So to our new subscribers, you don't hear us pitch. Let's stop the episode now. Just press pause. Just relax, calm down and smash the subscribe button. <laughs> just, and just drop a like, man. You, you, you're watching, you may as well plug in. And for our, our podcast listeners, Spotify reviews, You've been great. Like we've doubled since we've been doing this little, I don't know, little teaser. Yeah, all right. The That's reviews good. have been coming in. So if you just, it costs you nothing, just quick five stars. You can even just put NA in the comment. Just put a little five stars. It raises the platform. And once again, what you guys get out of it is we want to get to a point where we're doing two episodes a week. We get a lot of DM talking about we should bring two episodes a week. That can only be done if you're subscribing. So we're getting our YouTube revs up. So yeah, that's the little teaser. Yeah, no, but if you have any questions about hairlines, because <laughs> you know what I saw hella comments people were shocked oh, yeah, yeah. at the amount of pain that because so many people were tagging their friends like yo bro you sure you want to do this like? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like you're the spokesperson for hairlines now yeah, I did I started like tagline hairlines matter <laughs> <laughs> but I know you know what's funny I forgot to even tell you like, I've, when, since we did that clip I got eight DMs is it? Like saying, yo, bro, where'd you get your thing done? I had full dialogue. <laughs> full dialogue, like, with them. And they were like, oh, like, I was thinking of Turkey. And I was like, yeah, you can. Oh, yeah. So now we're going to be sponsored by Hairlines. Yeah. All right, cool. So there's no any more. brands in Turkey, like, yeah. I'll, yeah. <laughs> you didn't even get yours done in Turkey, though. Yeah, I know, but um, globalization. Yeah, all right, cool, cool. <laughs> well, I don't mind. But, um, yeah, so bringing it into the topic of today. Um, obviously, you, we touched on it before. Um, you've actually been adopted. Mm -hmm. And Mahalia, you're actually an adopter. Yeah. So we wanted to bring a wider question and probably starting with you, Christine, first. Mm -hmm. Your journey of adoption, when did you realise that you were adopted? When, like, how do you break that, that conversation? Mm -hmm. And that one caveat I wanted to ask, did they have to match up the family in terms of um, demographic? Because mm -hmm. I had a kid in my school who was adopted, but at the time of his adoption, they would, oh, he's mixed race. Mm -hmm. They would only let him go to a parent that was of colour. Mm -hmm. One of them had to be of colour. Yeah. Otherwise, they weren't. He was yeah. allowed to to go to the family, yeah. and that created problems for him because at that time, people of colour weren't really adopting kids. So mm -hmm. it took a while for him to be adopted. So yeah, it's a really good question. It's the question I get asked <laughs> most of all when I tell people I'm adopted. Is when did you find out? In all honesty, I don't know. I've just known my whole life. I can't remember a sit down conversation. I can't remember suddenly realizing there was no epiphany moment. It's just always been a part of me. And I always ask my parents like, how, how did you do that? How, how did you manage to make me always know? And they said it started with when I would go to bed at night. So I've been placed with my adopted parents since I was about nine months old. And what they used to do was when they put me to bed, 
whether it be my mum or dad, either one of them, they'd always let me know, mum loves you, dad loves you, and Jackie loves you, and that's the name of my birth mother. Mm. So it was always ingrained in my consciousness. Mm. As I got older, it was things like, um, my mum said one time she realised that I really understood was we was watching a TV show, I was about four or five years old. I don't remember this, but she's she's told me about it. Um, and there was someone who was adopted on the TV, and she said to me, she turned and said to me, um, oh, that's like you. you. You know that that's, that's like you. And apparently I just went, yeah. And that was it. Like, I'd go to school and I, I would talk about it. Everything I knew, you know, my, my parents were always really open. There was a bit of a filter, obviously, when I was very young. They didn't really go into any details. Um, but it's just, it's always been something that I've known. Um, and I have to admire my parents for that. Because for me, like, it would have been a lot more traumatic I think if I could remember one time where it's like oh I'm adopted mm. especially because I was adopted so young if I'd already started to you know see my mum and dad as mum and dad which they are to then be told you're adopted it might I don't know I haven't experienced it but it might cause a bit of a setback mm. um in terms of demographic I believe when I was adopted so I was adopted between 2000 and 2001 I do believe that they had to match you so both my parents are white however I look nothing like them they're mm. both very short I'm quite tall and they both have dark hair as well um I always feel like they, they kind of look like Italian, I guess I want to say, but they're not, they're, they're fully British, but um, I don't look like them. And also they're older parents as well. And I remember in school, you know, in the early years, people used to ask me if they were like my grandparents or something. <laughs> and I used to have to go, no, it's my mum and dad. And <laughs> my mum has a sister who, um, I used to spend a lot of time with her, my auntie. And uh, she, she looks quite a bit like me. And I remember one time I was in about year five and she came to pick me up. And before I'd come out the school gates, everyone was coming up to me, Christine, oh my God, oh my God, your birth mum's here. She's come to pick you up. And I'm like, oh my God, really scared. And I go outside and I'm like, it's my auntie, like, <laughs> just put me through all that shock for nothing. Um, so yeah, when, when I was adopted, I do believe that it was, um, you know, trying to find a match, but I won't be able to relate to your friend because obviously I'm, I'm white, yeah, so it's, it's going to be a different so there's thing. Going, there's going to be more suitors within you. Yeah, exactly. But one of the things that was important for my adoption, so my parents, they found a child that they were going to adopt but they then couldn't because the child's birth parents live next door to my nan. Yeah, too close. So there has to be a proximity thing involved. They have to be able to know that you're not going to bump into the birth parents, mm. especially if it's a closed adoption, which mm. means no contact with the birth mm. family. Do closed adoptions usually happen because, for example, the mum was, say, a crackhead or there was problems within the household or...? So... In in modern sorry in modern sort of like as we are not often you get closed adoptions if there's like a real like say it was a crime family mm. or you know the the birth father was like really dangerous then they might consider it on risk factor but they they want to try and keep it as open as possible mm -hmm. so that's not something that's you know, uh, a regular thing. Most adoptions are open in terms of letterbox contact. So letterbox contact is where the um, birth parent will write a letter once a year or maybe twice a year. It'll get sent to social services. They will read the letter. They might um, mm -hmm. redact it if necessary. And then they send it on to the um, adopter and then the adopter's got a choice of whether to read that to the child or keep that for when they're um, older. older and it's that's what I had it's also the adopter's choice whether to write back or not so you don't have to write back um, it's advisable but you don't have to do that and some adopters they'll send letters even though they don't receive any that was oh just to the to, to like as a, like an olive branch to mm -hmm. yeah just the, just a, just as a marker um, so to, to the um, to the uh, birth parents, some adopters send pictures. Um, some adopters sometimes send, you're not allowed to for yeah, some, identifying for, for reasons. reasons mm. But some send like pictures where it'll just be the child from behind, um, or they might send drawings, or they might send neither of those and just a short um, letter, factual letter about what's happening. 
So it depends on the situation. Do you find for some children that meeting their birth parents can be anticlimactic? And what I mean is, cause yep. I know someone that's who's who another person that was adopted, and obviously they've grown up. The presumption is if the by the adopter would raise them in a loving home, this is mum and dad, then they go and beat their birth parent. And they're like, ah, this is not really who I would want to be if I had a choice, like my mum or dad. I think I think it depends on. <laughs> what sort of story you've been told about your birth parents. I mean, if you have had adopters who've been honest with you, so obviously you're not going to tell a four-year-old the ins and outs, but as they get older, you're going to tailor the story to their maturity and age. But obviously if you've just been told that it's all fine and it was just, you know, some sort of fairy tale, then I guess it is going to be anticlimactic if you meet them and they are still hooked on drugs or, you know, really disorganised in their life. But I think that's why social workers are quite strong on making sure that you tell the children, A, that they're adopted, and B, what their story is. You have this thing called a life story book. Yeah. So they give you um, basically everything, all the reports, why they were removed, all those bits and bobs, and they uh, tell you everything that went on, even the really horrible things. And you're supposed to tell your child because what you don't want is, like you said, a sort of anticlimactic meet. But you don't want some drunk uncle at a party, you know, spilling it out. You yeah. Know, so, so you don't want them to be shocked. And also it's a matter of trust because if you don't tell them what went on, they will find out eventually. And then they won't believe maybe the reason why they were removed in the first place. You see what I mean? So it's a it's a it's a it's a trust thing. So it can be quite scary because it's a lot of information for a small child to have, but it's important because if you don't give them the information, then they create their own story, their own fairy tale. It's like when parents get divorced, your dad's left, but your mum doesn't say why, then you start creating in your mind reasons why he might have left. So it's important in any context where where a, a grandparent or a birth parent or any family member is no longer in that child's life to be really honest on a, a age appropriate level but to be honest with that child mm -hmm. when when do you think that introduction would be in terms of talking to you straight away straight away oh. straight away so for instance you know um if you were to if you if you had a a child whose birth parent had mental health problems you might not say that straight away you might say that they were really sad Okay. When, they, when they're three, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just like when you when you tell a child that they the the parents died, you'd be like, oh, they're not with us; they've gone away for school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. then they're but not if they're back. fifteen, you, that's not the same conversation yeah, 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 you're yeah. going to have. So as they get older, you're telling them the same story. Just the way you're telling that story evolves and gets more detailed until you get to a point when they're eighteen or whenever it is, where you can just sit down and say, "Listen, this is what happened." We save balls. <laughs> <laughs> Support for today's episode is brought by Manscaped, who is the best in the, in the below waist grooming. Their pr products are precision engineered for the family jewels. Manscaped Performance Package, the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20 percent of and free worldwide shipping with the code domino effect don't fucking just go and buy it put domino effect because we need we put the domino code in the thing listen yeah let me be real yeah i shave my balls <laughs> <laughs> seven billion men worldwide <laughs> if my maths is correct was that seven billion seven million seven million seven million and one because i shaved my balls yes. <laughs> That's 14 million bulls that have been uh, saved by this product. The lawnmower trimmer, yeah, 4.0, is the future of groom grooming, and dare I say, the greatest bull trimmer ever. And this one's not used, we've got a few boxes before you think we're just putting pubes all over the studio and that. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. Similar to a problem that Ed's had. Get me. Yeah. Right, don't try to just pin it on. <laughs> Eject guy. The lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof and also has a 4,000K LED spotlight you need for a precise shave. So when you're trimming in the dark, mm. it has a little light that flashes. Yeah? So, it, like, when you, so let's say you're, you're in a rush, you've got a date, Valentine's Day is coming, yeah? Mm. Quickly just in the dark. Get me? So the room's still set, ambiance is still ready. It's got a little LED light for that as well. 
You know what my biggest pet peeve? You probably don't have it, but with my Asian Asian genetics, sometimes if I get a little, like, little, you know what I'm saying? I have to go to barbers, like, sort that out. I've, really? Like, it pokes out, bruv. Yeah, me. Start coming out, like, you know, um, like, Dr. Seuss, bruv. The Weed Whacker is also waterproof and provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps reduce nicks, knacks, and tugs in those delicate nose holes. Just nose holes, no other holes before you get any ideas, <laughs> guys. And the Bull Deodorant and Crop Reviver. This That's is what it. Kevin Samuels was saying to you, man. We actually use this. I use this like maybe once every every few days on my balls. Show the man them. What, you got the bull toner? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that keeps the skin nice, refreshing. Mm. Yeah, so at least when the balls are shaved, you don't want your balls to be rough in it when the gal them do what the gal them do. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, it's a toner. It helps to revive the skin in the area, yeah? And you know what Manscaped even did? They even threw in some boxes, bruv. You get me? Some I don't know what size they are, though, but, you know. Yeah. Just make sure you got a big piece, bruv. You know what I mean? It's going to be sagging. What size these are? I'm going to try them on, though. Once again, guys, you get 20% plus free shipping, but make sure you put Domino Effect in the discount code. And, yeah, but hit us on the DMs. Tag us. We're going to repost your stuff to our stories, so just tag, tag Domino Effect, and we'll be reposting all your stories. And let us know how, yeah, if you do get it, yeah. Let us know your experience of it. And then- for us, it's been great, because I had the, the 2.0... I actually bought that before we even had this brand deal. So I was, I was gonna say who you bought it from, but there's no point in saying that. That's just trying to plug the next man. But <laughs> he basically seen it somewhere else. I was like, fuck it. I needed yeah. something like this, so let me try it out. So even before we got reached out to you by Manscaped, he was already using the product. So you already knew what I'm going. Like, I'm, I'm completely new to it, and now my balls are fresh, bruv. <clears throat> beard guy members, they've been connecting beard since 2019. Yeah? What did I say to Tommy when he first came? If you look at his book, beardless. If you look at him now, Sexy, do you get me? <laughs> That's what beards do, you know? So if you want to grow your beard, keep it nice and moist when the gal them come around. Look, Valentine's Day is coming and the girls love to stroke up a beard, yeah? Make sure to invest in beard gang members. <laughs> do you agree with the process, um, how it works now? Or is, is there like improvements that need to be made? Because upon hearing um, with the, the post box letter situation, <laughs> sending a picture of the back of the child to me, seems pretty like harsh but obviously i don't know the, the, the details that might be involved but like so, do, you, so, do you agree that so works there, there are improvements that can be made with the process but the letterbox contact what you've got to understand is it's not for the birth parent mm-hmm. that's not why we're doing it okay so why it's, is it? it's for a record for the child okay and often as well i i do get the sense a lot of the time that letterbox like the contact that is there is so that it's less like it's so that the birth parent doesn't contest as much at the court stage because if you can sort of say to them look just don't create a fuss Mm -hmm. you're gonna get a letter once a year it eases their distress because the thing with adoption it's such a severe thing to do such a severe thing to do to a parent because you're severing the ties between a parent and a child legally and when is a Animal, sorry, when's animal most dangerous is when it's wounded. So you, at that point, when the court, the court is going to sever the ties between a parent and show you don't know what they're going to do. They might try and kidnap the child, do, do something crazy. That's the most dangerous point. And when a child is in foster care, when they're about to get adopted. So a lot of the times I feel like they use the letterbox contact as a way to sort of sort of soothe the birth parent. Does that work though? Did it, did no, not them? always. I it didn't work with mine. No. So my I was adopted because as far as I'm aware, I was the product of a one night stand. My biological mother has severe mental uh, problems. Um, I don't just mean, you know, she was a bit depressed. She <laughs> suffered with psychosis, uh, something called borderline personality disorder and mm-hmm. severe OCD as well. Um, what- you know, your birth father. Uh- Yeah, so I I know who he is. Um, He didn't want to be involved. He had two children of his own. Um, Obviously, I was the product of possibly some kind of mistake. I'm born in September, so I imagine it was a Christmas party or something. (laughs) Um, That's just me dating dating back. Um, But, you know, he he didn't want anything. And Mm. and I imagine part of that, I mean, I'm, I'm... 
presuming this. I can't possibly know. I'm speculating. But I imagine part of it was the severity of my birth mother's mental illness that Mm -hmm. probably scared him quite a bit. And I think when social services approached him and asked, would he take me? He just said, no, I can't can't deal with this. And if he's got two other kids, that might affect what he would have thought is the integrity of his current... Well, he wasn't with their mother. Oh, okay, okay. So he was single, but I'll get into that a bit later. Okay, sorry. Um, So... Yeah, my so he was gone from the get go straight away. Didn't want any, didn't want anything, didn't want to be involved. So he signed the papers and everything. Um, a DNA test also had to be done because my birth mother had a boyfriend at the time. Oh wow! And yeah. it, it turned out that the other one was my birth father. Um, but that's for later when we go down into the biological <laughs> route. Um, so yeah, she did not believe she was mentally ill whatsoever, which is devastating because she had no self awareness. So. She knew that she wanted to keep me, but she couldn't take any of the steps in order to make that a possibility. So she wouldn't comprehend that she was mentally ill. She would, even after being sectioned, go to the local papers and make up stories that I was being taken away for no good reason and that there was some kind of conspiracy against her. She would put up pictures of me in local shops um, saying, have you seen my child and reported me as a missing child? because I'd been taken by social services and she just was not having it. She was not having me being put up for adoption and she fought every step of the way to try and stop that happening. My adopted parents met her in court um, because obviously it had to go to court because she wouldn't consent to it. And the what was agreed was that they were going to keep my name, my first name and my middle name. Obviously my surname had to change legally so they kept my name and they also said that they would do the letterbox service so that to her was meant to be that sort of olive branch the kind of negotiation that like look if you consent um but it didn't work for her because she was so far gone away from reality it just didn't work and and it just had to go through the court and and you know it got ordered that I had to be adopted she did agree to the letterbox and she did do it every single year um is it one one letter a year one letter a year Mm. yeah so they weren't allowed to give pictures of me because I'd been adopted in the same borough so I was born in Croydon and I was also adopted in Croydon all right so she can come see Mm. you so if she saw me it would have been a a very high risk to that'd be traumatic as well to me yeah so there were no pictures but my parents would write for the benefit of her mental health, a factual letter. So no emotions in it, just simply what I was doing in school, things I'd achieved, maybe a picture that I'd drawn, things like that. And she would write her whole internal monologue back. And I mean, 60 pages, handwritten front and back, her emotions, uh, everything that had happened to her that she could fit in in a year. She would write in a way that, you she was writing what she was thinking as she was thinking it and what was really interesting for me is that she her handwriting would change and obviously she has a personality disorder so you could really see the extent of her mental health through the letters oh so you've read through it yeah so adopted children are really curious naturally because we know that there's things that we don't know so you know the original plan was that i would read all these letters when i was 18 or when I was old enough to comprehend. But, you know, me being me and being curious, if my parents would go to the shop or something, I knew where the letters were. So I'd just go read them anyway. Um, What age did you read the person? Before 10. Oh, shit. Wow. Wow. Do you feel like you should have waited? Yes. (laughs) Can Can I just say something, if you don't mind? I just wanted to acknowledge as well, I don't want to seem like we're just um, bashing like birth parents. Although the children are often abused and neglected, there is a lot of pain there. And someone had to lose for me to win. Mm -hmm. For me to become an adoptive parent, someone had to lose. A grandparent is never going to walk their uh, grandchild to school. A cousin is never going to be able to, you know, mock their cousin at a wedding. So... There's a lot of loss there. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to like denigrate that because f- obviously for those birth parents, it's a trauma that reoccurs every year. Mm-hmm. You know, when they're writing that letter, that's a reminder. And on the birthday as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, birthday, Christmas. So <coughs> although obviously 
they the, the children that come to be adopted have been neglected there's also um you know it's not, it's like a zero sum game like there's no, there's no winner you, do, you know, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a loss for the birth parent and also as well the birth father who might not even have a say. You mm. imagine you you find out after your child's been adopted that they've been adopted and you are never going to get to see that child again. Mm-hmm. And, and would you say that's the normal? Or would you say most of the time the birth father just doesn't? Want I to I, I I think uh, I think often what happens is the birth mothers don't want to say who the birth fathers are mm-hmm. yeah. because it's. One thing for someone else to look after your child who you're never going to meet, who you're never going to know, but to have the birth father possibly having complete custody over that child, it, I think that's just too painful. That's actually... What, for the mother? Yeah. That's actually a bit twisted though, isn't it, really? Yeah. If you think about it, it's, like, oh, it's almost like, oh, I can't have you so no one else will. Yeah. Well, I'd rather someone, a complete stranger, have you than... Yeah, that's not. Yeah, that's quite very extremely selfish. But I but yeah, guess I, I guess we're looking at it from pe- from a point of view of people who are thinking straight. We're not looking at it from a point of view of who someone who's been maybe sexual mm. the whole life, who is mm. uh, prostituting themselves, who is um, selling drugs, who has got a very disordered life, who's got severe mental health problems. So we're expecting we're expecting someone who is experiencing trauma to be thinking logically but just, just, just a caveat that's got my brain thinking as well you talked about prostitution i would kind of get it from the, the prostitute's perspective in the sense of oh wait hold on i'm walking the street corners and one of my clients has got me pregnant i don't want the kind of man that would actually pay for my services to be looking after my child as well i, th- I think a lot of times it'd be the pimp and they think they love them Mm. Even then, even the pimp, like, do you really want a pimp to be the one raising? But again, are you th- are you thinking in a cognizant, yeah. like, on a logical level? And they 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 genuinely think those men love them. They th- they think mm. they. they yeah, but that's a good pimp, though. Like, yeah. like objectively speaking, not saying that pimping's good, <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah. pimping properly. It's when when you get, for instance, mothers who have taken up with men who are um, pedophiles, God. and social services ask them to make a choice and for a lot of people they just can't understand why the mother makes a choice for the man but in her view she might have a chance to get her child back if she gets rid of the man she will never be able to find someone who loves her like that again and it is twisted logic but that's do you see what I mean for someone who's it's twisted but it, it makes sense yeah it's not it's not irrational yeah it's just weird yeah, and, and, and that, that's to who you're working with people, women mainly, who are severely traumatised. So, I, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm just, we're just out here like, God. Oh, yeah, bashing, parents, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. parents yeah. are terrible because some of the stories and the life experience some of the birth mothers have had, and birth fathers as well, I don't know if I would be any different in my capabilities to raise a <laughs> child because they, have, they just haven't got the tools. Mm. I understand. I've got a two-part question because I was listening to a lady called um, Ruth Roning um, and she was talking about, she was she was adopted herself and she was yeah. speaking about how, you know, like she's the physical embodiment of trauma from wow. her birth parents. Yeah. Wow. So she often spoke about how she knew she was adopted similar to you because she was just so different from her parents. Like she came from a family mm-hmm. of athletes. So when she when she was growing up, she was wanting to go swimming. She was very athletic. She mm-hmm. wanted to do sports, but then her parents were just like, just not like that. Mm-hmm. So she often talked about having identity crisis. Yeah, you know, she listed yep. up a, a, a listed off a, a bunch of things so like suicide rates, mm-hmm. crime, etc. Yeah. Um, but because of that identity issue, there was a, that lack of uh, understanding of self. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for yourself, mm-hmm. how how was it with like your identity? And secondly, how would you curb that as an adopted as a parent that's adopted? Like how would you mitigate the identity issues that might happen with kids that are? I, th- I think. The, the, if you think about an adopted child, ad, an adopted child, as and please interrupt me if you, if I'm like way off here, like a house with um, crumbling foundations. Mm-hmm. Yes. Your your job as <laughs> I the adopted use that parent myself. is to shore up those foundations as much as you can. And if you have subsidence, there's only so much you're going to be able to do. 
Mm. So, uh, you, do you know what I mean? There's only so much you, you're going to be able to do, um, depending on how the child comes to you. But that's your job to just um, love them and give them, and not even just love them, give them tight, concise boundaries. And a lot of people um, don't understand this, that they think you should just let children be free. But children get worried when they've got no rules. If you think about walking on a rope bridge, if you had no sides, you'd feel unsteady. What makes you feel safe is that you've got tight um, railings to guide you to your destination. And that's what adopted children, I think, in my view, that they need. And also you need to be truthful about their background. That's where the identity thing comes in. And you need to be um, honest about what happened to them. And I think you need to choose good schools. You need to make sure that your family is supportive. And I think the school, choosing a good school that understands how to um, work with adopted children is really important because a lot of adopted children suffer from attachment disorder. So that's really important. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's my view on that, really. Yeah, no, I have to agree with you. I mean, I used to think that my parents were quite strict growing up, but in retrospect, I see why it was necessary. Because when you have your foundation is essentially broken, the house is always wobbly. So if you've got all of that unknown chaos... If you don't have structure in place, you can descend into that chaos at any point. So you need something to grab. You need something to hold on to. Um, and that's why adoption is so good, because for people like myself who have come from complete chaos, to have a stable line that I always know I can cling on to, it's life saving, really, because chaos kills it really can and like you were saying that lady talks about suicide rates it doesn't shock me at all mm -hmm. because the whirlwind of emotions involved in adoption are so complex there's not one feeling or another that you feel it's every emotion you could possibly imagine and there's a lot of different things involved i have always suffered with i call them existential crises rather than identity crises because you know I know what I like and I know what I don't like and things like that. But questions that have always entered my mind is, you know, which we all do at some point. But I feel like when you're adopted, you start to question these things, perhaps a lot younger. I would go to my dad and ask him questions like, why am I here? What's the point to life? Hmm. What, why, why is this my life? And, and what's the point to everything? And it really opens up all these philosophical questions, but at a really young age. Is that because you, you don't come from them that you had the, the question? Yeah. So when, when you know that there's something different about you in the sense of I, one thing for me, just me personally, that was really mind blowing is the fact that when you go see your mum, and I mean, you guys, I assume you, you know, neither of you adopted, you both no. with your biological parent or parents when you go see your mum how does it not blow your mind you 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 came out of her you how do you not look at her stomach and think oh my god I was in there because for me that concept is alien to me I can't mm -hmm. even conceptualize that so you know I see my mum as my mum my adopted mum and I see my dad as my dad but the thought of actually sharing blood and flesh and actually coming from being a product of I can't conceptualize there's a barrier I, yeah there's a barrier I can't understand it and that's why I think I personally think I don't know I don't have any statistics to back this up but I personally think that most adopted children do want to meet their biological parents and I don't think it's because they want to reconnect with them and then be with them forever i think it's more just a conceptual thing to it's be a able to puzzle exactly to be able to point and go oh that's where i came from mm. because you can know all the stories you can know all the facts and details you can know why it's necessary but really like i think seeing it in the flesh would make all the difference it's interesting you say that wasn't it because okay. because like i was reading about and, and, and you, you mentioned it off camera about like knowing Mm. But in part of me thinks that, and we were talking about trauma, mm. and what I was reading was that from a biological and DNA standpoint, when a kid is removed from their biological parents, 
there's a, there's an immediate trauma that comes in. The body knows. The body, the body knows, knows straight away. 100%. But then part of me thinks, cool, um, you know, it, it's, it makes sense to tell the child, okay, this is the situation. But wouldn't part of that be curbed when a child is told way older, like 18 plus, when they've been able to establish their identity yeah. to be like, yo, listen. That would hurt. This is the reality of the situation. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's like hurt. your whole life's been a lie, basically. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that's, that's it. What, yeah. It, what it is, is you don't, You. Th this is why I was saying that you have to be honest because especially about them being adopted as well. And you actually, if you've um, adopted one child and you haven't told them, they won't let you adopt another. Okay. S because what you don't want is a Jerry Springer moment. For do, do they ask the child, has your parents told you? They so when you go through the adoption process, if you have any birth children or adopted children, they, they'll speak to them. Okay. And the thing is, you don't want a Jerry Springer moment because if they can't trust you with such a fundamental thing, mm. how can they believe the reasons why they were even removed? Mm -hmm. And then they start to doubt everything. So it's and then so it becomes important. an existential yeah. crisis. And can I just make one more point? You were saying about you know identity, mm -hmm. and you were talking about earlier about like race and you know ethnicity. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things why it's not a law or you know, like a thing that's written down. But one of the reasons why it's so important to match children by, um, and it's not just even ethnic background, it's by, like, you wouldn't want a Scottish child who lives in Scotland maybe being um, adopted by a Welsh couple. Yeah. And it's not, it's not. Why? Because all things being equal, if we have a Welsh couple and we have um, a Scottish couple, then it's better for that child to be adopted in Scotland by a Scottish couple because that's their identity. If all things aren't being equal, then we just have to we just have to have whoever is available to adopt the child. But if we have a mixed mm. race child, because that I see more than the example. So sorry, sorry to yeah, cut yeah. You, because for example, if a Nigerian couple adopts adopts a fully Jamaican child, as far as the child would be aware they can assimilate into the Nigerian identity as a Jamaican, but... Depends how old the child is. Mm. And yeah, I'm just talking yeah, about, let's, like, yeah. all be, like, say, let's say nine months old, you can just assimilate and that's yeah. what you would think that you would be. But if you're completely, like, I don't know, like, the odd Dalmatian, then yeah. then it's more of a difficult... Yeah. But I, 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 I've got a... I knew someone who was Asian and adopted an Asian child. And... Uh, it's, it, it is and it isn't because the child she adopted was Sikh. She's not Sikh. She's mm. Muslim. So How, then, but religion then we get into no. language. Mm. Well, the child was being... See, this is where it gets, like you say, it gets squirrely because it depends where the child was fostered because that comes into it as well. Mm. So, for example, if you are an Eastern European child and you've been fostered by... Black Caribbean. Yeah, that makes sense yeah. to me, but Sikh and let's say Sikh and Hindus. Yeah. Same country, similar languages, completely different different religion. But if you were to assimilate that, it's almost like feral children. If you're raised from such a young age with a pack of wolves, you will believe that you're a wolf and you wouldn't really know any different, you know? I, I, I do agree with you, but I think it's where like language and things like that come in and what you're, what you're after when you match a child and adoptive parents is the best possible match. Mm. So what, what, what yes, sir, we, we don't want the placement to break down. And the best way we can <laughs> mitigate those circumstances is matching the child as closely is with the type of pet adoptive mm. parents as they would have come from. Mm -hmm. I get that at a later, later age, but language and, and culture aren't hereditary, you know? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Whereas, yeah. like, yeah. I'm talking about the physical oh, well, like, yeah, you when can see, yeah, You can when, see, like, yeah. I'm not like these guys, but yeah. if, you're, if you were taken from a young age and you... As, I use the, the black example as easy. Yeah. As a Jamaican child and you were taken to Nige and you were raised in the culture, you would just think that you, was, yeah, you would I, not I, know I, yeah, any different... I totally agree with you that on a sort of purely racial basis when they're smaller. But obviously, most children aren't adopted when they're babies. Fair enough. Yeah. So okay. that's that's the issue because most children who um, come into care aren't relinquished. They're removed. And that doesn't ho often happen until a much later stage because things don't often go... I mean, there are cases where things go wrong from the off. But most of the babies that get removed from birth, they've had previous children removed 
at a later stage. Do you see what I mean? Mm. I mean, so that's why they're removing the baby. So the average age of a child coming into care is, uh, well, being adopted is three. But the average age of a child going into care is quite old. Oh, really? Why, why, why is, because do you think? Because what, what happens is you don't, the abuse is hidden when they're preschool. So they're at home. So who, who is seeing what's going on? Unless it comes to the attention of um, a health visitor or maybe a doctor or, you know, just a nosy neighbour. But most of the abuse comes to light when they start school. Mm. So that's why you see an exponential increase and uptick in children being removed once they start primary school. Because mm. then the school starts to notice. That's why during the pandemic, people <coughs> were like so alarmed that children were being sent home because for some children that was their only safe place escape yeah people noticing that they weren't being fed or mm -hmm. that they weren't clean so that's mad I'll, 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 wait, wait, hold I'll, on just because obviously before I, had, I, did, I did have a um a point to mention you know how you're talking about oh would it hurt more as an eight uh, as an 18 year old to find out that you're not adopted mm -hmm. if you talk from a personal standpoint say you was with a, a female and you end up getting her pregnant if she were to tell you from the off that it wasn't your child and you stayed with her, I don't know why you just stay with her anyway, but let's just yeah. say you did, it wouldn't hurt as much as of her getting to 18 and her saying, oh, by the way, yeah, yeah, you know, you've looked after sense. for this period, it actually isn't yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. one point I did want to, that I feel like we didn't fully round off, I just wanted to go back to it, the letters. So what did you find when you were going through the letters? You said you read them at 10 mm -hmm. and then, so what did... So when you're a child, um, it's hard to conceptualise things with depth. So something like a severe mental illness, a child isn't going to be able to understand. Mm -hmm. So I would take her letters at face value. So I would read her saying social services are evil people who took you away and you were stripped from me and these people don't intend what's best for you. I Part of me would take that at face value. I've always been cared for enough by my adopted parents to know that there was something wrong with her so whilst I would know when reading it that I was adopted for my best interests her voice would swirl around in my head mm -hmm. and I would have those doubts and what happens as a result of that is the fantasy so I uh, this is gonna sound really cringe but I often had the Tracy Beaker fantasy. So, you know, Tracy Beaker has this image of her birth mum mm -hmm. and she says, you know, she's got the best car. She's really cool. She's coming to get me one day. It wasn't with me all the time, but when I'd get in trouble or when things were bad at home, as they are for everyone at some point or another, that would pop into my head. And I lived in that fantasy place thinking it doesn't matter that I'm sad now because one day I'll be reunited with her and everything will be good again that's not crazy that's just sad that makes me upset <laughs> it's, it's so funny talking about these things with people because it's like i was saying off camera earlier when i was at school you know i would be sharing all these things thinking they're really cool and unique because it's different mm. but that's because when you're a child there's a bit of a disconnect to understand that all of this stuff is you yeah so mm. you mentioned the life story book i'd never got one of those i didn't get one till i was 16. there were a lot of faults in my adoption by social services things weren't carried out particularly well and there were occasions of leaks um which is another story but you know I, I, I'm so open about these things and that's what is my sort of saving grace in all of this is that I do know everything and I have been given enough in, information that as I've got older, I've been able to conceptualise it. But the kind of downside of that is that I don't, I don't quite realise that it is really sad. It is mm. a really sad thing. That's, a, that's just a reality. Y you know, but because I've always known, I can't imagine anything else. So to me, it doesn't sound as heartbreaking as it might sound to someone mm. from the outside. Um, but don't get me wrong, you know, that's a, that's a journey. That's a journey to conceptualise that that happened to me and that it's not just some story and that it's my real life. But mm. what you say about the, um, the letters... I do regret reading them as young as I did. But I do think it was necessary for me to have read them and not waited till I was 18. Why? Because it's a connection. It's that filling the void in a way. Because when you are removed, 
there is a void. <laughs> like we mentioned, the, the body knows. And whether you know you're adopted or not, there will be a void and there will be trouble with attachment. Um, you know, it depends on the case, but only talking from personal experience. I was obviously taken from my birth mother. Then I was placed into foster care. So already one att one attachment's broken. I formed another. I was in foster care for probably a, a minimum of six months. Sorry, can I ask how many foster carers you had? Just one. Oh, okay, that's really And it was a lady. Her name's Linda. If you're seeing this, Linda, hello. <laughs> um, and then that was broken. And then I was placed in an adopted home. And the reason I say broken is because your attachments... Sorry, because I'm ignorant. What's the difference in terms of why do people not maintain an in foster homes is that just because you said you only had one carer so why didn't she adopt you and why did so she was going to so uh, she she would have adopted me if i had been there by the time i was one um but she did already have her own children as well and, and quite a few of them so i would have been the only adopted child among a bunch of birth children and we, we we were speaking about this off camera so i was saying that a lot of um the difference between adopters and foster carers is most foster carers have their but they have birth children. So in a house, you might have like five children. So it's it's not it's it's not always easy for then the um and the, there'll be a mixture of adopted uh, foster children and birth children. So it's not always easy for the foster carer to adopt the um the child it depends on their age etc etc but also social services it's really frowned upon it's, it's really frowned upon for foster carers to adopt the child that they're fostering well what so, so sorry because i'm i'm really ignorant yeah. like, i'm trying to so f how does a foster carer different from being in care like how does the pros because i'm trying to oh, right. so for, to me okay. i use it's foster and okay. adopters interchangeably so, so, so i don't yes. i don't so, get the difference so, so we so a foster carer um is not the legal guardian or parent of the child mm -hmm. state is okay yeah so for example if i was fostering um and i wanted to take that child like i wanted to go on holiday i'd have to ring the social worker and say can i take this child on holiday and if they say no, you're not going on holiday. Mm. Can I get this child a haircut? Can I, or anything you want to do as a, as you would a parent, you you have to ask the social social services. That's if you're doing short term foster care. If you're doing long term foster care, you have s slightly more slack, so you can change the surname and you can change their school, for example, without asking permission. Well, why, why doesn't that just become adoption then? Why because do you? Because not just adopt, if that makes sense. Yeah, because not all children can be adopted legally. So, for example, you might have a parent who has got cancer. What that child doesn't need to be adopted. OK, I get you. I get Do you, you see what I mean? They just yeah, need to okay. be taken care of. Or even um, parents who are disabled. It's not that they don't love their children or they neglect them. They just can't look after them. So why should they have their rights removed? So it's it's really dependent on the situation of, of why... You know, a child can't be adopted or sometimes it might literally be a child is, let's say they're 12 and they've got a 22 year old brother. Social services are just waiting for that brother to become a little bit more older mm -hmm. so that they can have that child. Actually, no, the twins that happened to um, my friend, actually, oh, right, right. He, he was, um, well, you know, I will bleep the name. Uh, when his when his mum passed away oh yeah yeah yeah. they yeah. had to wait for like him to get old enough yeah. so that so he actually what happened is the neighbour who was the mum's best friend looked after the younger brother for two years because she lived next door she, she would have done what's called kinship care okay so that's another type of foster care it's when you're related to the person you're fostering oh. them so it's called kinship care mm -hmm. and then you have another thing called SGOs as well special guardianship orders so you're related to the person mm -hmm. and you get an order from the court till they're 16 that you have total parental responsibility for that child. Okay, yeah, because yeah, that makes sense because otherwise he's, he, would, he was old enough, he was 16, yeah. but his brother would have had to have gone into care. Yeah. But that brings on to, how does care different to foster parents? Is care just like, like a, a kid's home essentially? Well, no, care is, care is a child who is in a children's home or in a foster placement or in a kinship arrangement, mm. 
mm. or in a I, I think young offenders might come in under that as well oh really yeah Why because, because you have secure units yeah, yeah, I've heard of secure units. Yeah, right? yeah, so you yeah, have yeah. secure units. So I think that that might come up. I'm not sure exactly, but so it's not really different. So you have children's homes, but they are mainly for old. See, they're for older children who can't manage to live in a family unit because they're so damaged. Mm -hmm. So the majority of children will not be living in uh, a children's home. They'll be living in a foster family environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also you have mum and baby units as well. I don't know yeah. if you heard of those. That's where oh, I was. Oh, what's oh, what's right. that? So if you have a mum that's very disorganised, maybe on drugs, and she's saying, I can do this, they'll say, okay, we're going to give you a chance. Because like I said, to remove a child from their birth parent is very severe. So they have these mum and baby units. It's funny, my sister's a paediatric community nurse oh, yeah. and she puts the measures in place. Oh, where she right. goes in the special measures, like, oh, this is going on. Yeah. We're going to give you a chance. And then she will call social services, like, oh, I don't yeah. think this is really working. Yeah, so the mum will go into what's called a mum and baby unit and the workers there will be assessing you all the time. They'll, and they try not to intervene too much because they want to let you stand or fall on your own actions. So they'll see, and there's help there, but you have to ask for it. They're not going to intervene. You have to ask for it because they want to see... If you can ask for help, because that's a sign of strength, being able to ask for help. Mm -hmm. So if at the end of the 12 weeks or the six months or whatever it is that you have harmed the baby or you've done something dangerous, then the child will go into foster care. or They might have an adopter lined up already and then you'll just go your own way. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say for the foster family, isn't it like... Isn't it with the kids that are currently adopted, isn't it a lot of choppy change if you're doing short term foster and you're constantly having new kids come in and out? I, I, for us, it, it wasn't. Um, it was it was actually quite nice because a lot of the children, even though it's short term, short term's anything from one day to three years. So were you a fosterer before you became an adopter? Yeah. Okay. We fostered for seven years before. Mm -hmm. We did short term. Children with disabilities mainly because um, they really struggled to get placements. So it... Like I say, it wasn't for us, but then if you struggle with that type of thing, then you can become a long-term foster carer or you can do mum and baby placements. Was, was it ever painful for you that, obviously your adopted kids, you have full oversight, but was it ever painful for you to have a set of foster kids and then they go on to other places and then life hasn't really worked out like how I, you would have wanted? I will say this. If you are a foster parent and you are not sad when the child leaves, you're not doing it right. Hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's my, because I don't, you know, I don't understand how you could have a baby. Like, we, we had um, babies that came straight from the hospital. Okay. And you have a baby and you look after it and it laughs and it coos at you. And then you're just going to be like, meh, when it leaves. That's not, you're not doing it right. And every time a child left, it was painful for me. But it's not about me. It's about them. Mm -hmm. My mum and dad all, uh, always tell me the story of when they went to pick me up for the final time from my foster. Um, I call her my foster mum, uh, the lady I mentioned, Linda. Apparently, when they came to pick me up for the last time, like she literally just opened the door, put me out like that, and you know, take and, her, yeah, yeah, and and it was painful for her. But obviously, because we all lived in Croydon. We used to see her like at the no, supermarket really, and things yeah. and be, hi Linda, like, you know, she'd be so happy and, you know, she's, she still sends birthday cards and everything, you know, they, the, these foster mums, they really do care, mm. but they understand that it, it's not, it's not about them. Mm. And, I, and I also say this as well, people, people, like people think, oh, but it's really painful for the social workers as well. You imagine you've taken a child who's in foster care from a safe environment, you know, safe and the courts told you. You have to take that child back to their birth parents where mm. you know mm -hmm. it's not a safe environment. Yeah, they, um, they, it's, I, I've seen social workers crying, you know, mm. like really upset that they've not been able to argue their case in court, that that house is not safe. And they have to take that child in a car, knowing that that child, they might get caught saying that child's died. You know, you know, you know, they know that's not a safe environment. But if you can't, you know, like how courts go, it's not about who's right or wrong. It's like who's got the best lawyer, oh, basically. Mm. So it's it's very distressful for them as well. I read some stories really where uh, um, kids who are adopted would often say that 
they they feared that they'd be given away if they acted yep. poorly. Yeah. Yeah. Is that anything you ever went through? Or? Yeah. Yeah. All you, the time. So you thought if you was bad, that oh, you want just to give me away? Yeah. And how did that affect you? You become a people pleaser. Oh, really? Mm, yeah. And also, I feel like this is something that's not talked about much. In the adopted realm, we'll call it the adopted space, there's all these books from birth parents. There's all these books from people who've adopted. Um, there's not many stories from the people who actually go through it. And one thing that I think is quite taboo that isn't spoken about um, is feeling like you have to perform. Mm. So you might feel like you have to perform in a certain way that these parents would want their natural child to behave. Mm. Or you might have to conform into certain things with this adopted family because you, you feel like you have to. Now, you know, I don't want to say it felt like that all the time, but that is something that happens and you know it's I think it I think it would happen either way whether the family was very open to who you are and you being different or whether the family wanted you either way I think there is going to be a bit of it's it's it kind of feels like a performance and I think the intentions for wanting to adopt have to be absolutely crystal clear my dad always says to me I say why did you adopt why was that an option because my mum can't have kids but he could have done Mm. And I said, why, why did you choose adoption? And he said, well, I just wanted to give someone a chance. So you're the only one of your, well, your mum and dad, that, essentially? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, the, I'm an only child and, oh, okay. and it, it's just me that they've got. But all of my cousins and everything, they're all natural family. Mm. So, you know, you do, don't get me wrong. I had a great time growing up. My family never treated me any different, but you do feel different. Mm. You can't help it because you know you are different. You know that something's not quite balanced, if that makes sense. You know, even things like I experienced it when my cousins started to have children. I'm the youngest in my adopted family by about 10 years. So that's another thing that sort of distanced me apart. When my cousins started to have children, people say, oh, don't she look like so-and-so? Don't he look like so-and-so? And when you're adopted... It sucks. Don't look like anyone. It sucks. Not not hearing. Oh, you look like so. I've never heard the words. Oh, you really look like so and so. And when you're adopted, you dream of hearing that one day because you've just never had it. Can I just? You know, when you were saying about you know people pleasing, I think what a lot of people don't realise is there are eighty three thousand children in care, and only two thousand children get adopted every year. Mm -hmm. That's not... So there's a massive dearth in terms of suitors. So it... They're, 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 and also within the range of um, people that want to adopt, it's very... It, it's very... Who wants to adopt older children? So then you get disabled children. So as we go down to the different categories, the amount of people who want to adopt those specific types of children dwindle. And the t the... So you get this thing in uh, care where a lot of the children are in quite large sibling groups. Mm. And as we were talking about before house prices, there are not many people who've just got a four bedroom house. Mm -hmm. So what do we do then with someone who's got, there's a group sibling group of five children and that happens a lot. Yeah, well, it, well, it, well, it makes sense in the sense of, the, just has hazard in a guess and this, this this isn't statistically proven but the most sought after would probably be or sought after and most suited in the UK would probably be a baby that is has no disabilities who's who's white that's probably going to be yeah. the, and girl, the one that would be girls. a oh girls why yeah. girls because that's interesting yeah why girls yeah because girls are seen as um, like more, more women are seen as more docile more easy so oh less problematic yeah less problematic yeah. and when you think about a boy in care you think about is he going to be doing drugs is he going to be like a road man is he going to be do you know what I mean yeah, yeah. so th that's the type of thing so boys um, struggle to get adopted um, children are over the age of seven struggle to get adopted they even sort of stop looking to be honest um, also like you say children with disabilities and mixed race children really struggle yeah. really really struggle and they struggle more than black children actually because when you're looking for a place 
you can just place a black child with a black family. Mm-hmm. But what do you do with a mixed race child? Do you put them with a white family? Do you put them with a black family? And then the amount of mixed race adopters are much smaller pool yeah. than black adopters. Leading on to that, I told, spoke earlier about my friend who was um, who ended up being adopted. Before he told me he was adopted, I was doing the maths and the maths didn't make sense because his mum or his adopted mum is mixed race right. and his dad is white. Right. But he's mixed race and he was darker than both of them. So yeah. I'm just like... Nah, what's going on here? This, this, the maths... <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a biologist, but I was thinking genetically it just didn't make sense. So I was thinking if they had been really stringent... They might, he might not have even been adopted, but like, oh, sorry, like your mum's fairer than you. And well, they, they, they actually used to be. And um, yeah, so basically, when we do you remember when we had the coalition government between Lib Dems and Conservatives? Mm-hmm. Um, they had a I can't remember what his name was, I think his name's Tim, Tim Loughton. I think he came from an adoptive family himself, so he actually relaxed the rules on that. Because it makes sense, though. social workers were being quite stringent and it was leaving a lot of um, black children and Asian children j- just in kind of this foster care limbo. It's better off being raised, in my humble opinion, to be raised by a family that yeah. is in your demographic and loves you yeah. than to be in a care home. Yeah, so we have the ideal of what we want for a child who's going to be adopted. But then once we can't find an ideal, then we just have to say we're just going to have some loving parents. Mm-hmm. You know, and th- th- this is the argument I always get when people say to me, should gay people adopt? And this is what I say to them. If you don't want gay people to adopt, then straight, more straight people need to start adopting. Mm. And the fact of the matter is, we're, it's not, it, it's the choice is they stay in care. That, that's the choice for them. Sorry, so a quick question. So the question around should gay people adopt, is it, what's the reason behind the question? Is it that it's better for, um, like a mother, like a male, female. Yeah, that, that, I think that, that that's their that that's their thing, and it's also mm-hmm. when you get religious communities blocking adoptions as okay. well of certain children. But then my argument is, if there was enough cohort of adopters of that religion or whatever, then you wouldn't need anybody else to come in. And sometimes it's not even just the the dynamic of going in a gay home whatever people's reservations might be that which isn't our own but just in terms of kids can be horrible the whole thing is yeah, like, yeah. growing up oh you have two dads ha 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 this kid could be bullied but that dynamic in my opinion is healthier than growing up in a care yeah mm. like loving parents and, and I, th- I think you you i mean my personal experience like adoption is very complex So imagine adoption for kids. So like when I would tell kids I was adopted at school, people were so confused. So I often had to explain things. And in primary school, it was fine. Um, It was just confusion. So like people would call my mum and dad, my adopted parents, my step parents. And I'd have to be like, no, 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 that's not what it is. They're not step parents. Or sometimes I would get called an orphan and I'd be like, no, no, no. My birth parents aren't dead. I'm not an orphan. So there's a lot of explaining that you have to do. Whereas when you go into secondary school, it's confusion as well, but added on to that presumptions because children start to get their own minds in secondary school. And like you say, kids get mean. Um, Was it a bully or anything for being adopted? Did yeah. anyone make, oh really? Yeah, yeah. Anything that's different. I mean, I was really different. What would I, they say? Uh, oh, like, no wonder you were adopted. You, you know, who would love you as a child? Your mum was a prostitute, this, no. that and the other. Um, you know, you're an orphan. Like, if I was your parents, I'd, I'd put you up for adoption too. Like, but I... Who did you go to? <laughs> like, really deep. Like, what, when I, Kids are horrible. But I, I was a, a specifically a target, not only because I was adopted. I was really into rock music as a teenager. I did the black hair, the lot. Mm. Mm. Part of me was asking for it, but can't say that's asking for no, it. When, not asking for it, but kids target. can't accept things that are different, yeah. and I looked different purely for my music taste. That's all it ever was. I just liked different music. I liked the black. I liked the guitars. I, I learned how to play guitar. I was really into it, and it was something I shared with my dad. My dad's really into rock music, mm. and that was our thing. When um, when we used to foster, and I think a lot of foster carers will um, sort of. Uh, back me on this is you often ask the children older ones what they what you what they want you to call what you want them to call them because when they're at school you don't necessarily want everybody to know that they're in foster care so you might say to them do you want to call me auntie so that when mm. they're referring to you that p- 
people don't know they're in foster care because like you were saying then they're prone for bullying and I can't imagine being told by and it, it, a lot of teachers don't understand it, I don't, teachers don't, don't have understand. a clue I used to get some crazy comments when I was fostering like what but I'd be like so you, you, you'd be out somewhere and they'd be like, oh, who's that baby? Are you the child mind? And I say, no, I'm not child mind. And then you go through the list of things that you could be. And then you might say, well, I'm the foster carer. And they'd, they'd say, so their, their, their parents didn't want them then. Yeah, and the child are really you're, vulgar you're, about you're, it. You're like standing with the child. And it, like just crazy comments. So you kind of think, oh, they'd say, so disgusting, you know, <laughs> these parents abusing their children. Like, and you're like, yeah, we can have this away from Yeah, you. yeah. Do you want to do this right it's, now? Uh, or they'd be like, oh, can you tell me, like, what happened to the child? Yeah. And you'd be, like, standing with the child. L- like People see us as headlines, yeah, definitely. Yeah, like, like Netflix series. People, or- yeah, and I'm like, I'm a person. I'm not yeah. just some story. Like People really want the thing. They want to get the popcorn out, tell yeah. me all about it. I know the ins and outs of it. And it's, it's so, what even, like, family members you have to be like from the get-go i'm just gonna tell you how this is i'm not gonna be getting into the nitty-gritty because it's not my story to tell mm-hmm. it's not my story to share it has to be us that so I, like, I would say to people, i'm very open about adoption i will give you an overview but i'm not going to tell you my children's story because it's not my story to share it's their story to share and some adopted mums some i don't know this is just from what i've seen in the adopted community in America. So from yeah. other adoptees. They, they overshare. They, they, yeah, they overshare. And, and it's like that whole, like, you know, get the popcorn out. They like to tell people the story of their child and they see their child's story as their story. It's like, mm-hmm. it's not your story. It's almost like an ego thing. Like, oh, like yeah. what I did and what I did for the kid. Oh yeah. Like, like I'm the hero that's yeah. come in. Yeah. Le- leading um, on stories. Obviously, you reached that again. You wanted to discuss a bit of your pathway now and obviously your birth mother, Jackie. So tell us a bit about that in terms of, well, we're leading on from the letters in terms of who do you see Jackie as now and actually on the pathway to meet her? Yes. Yeah, so um, the way that I decided to learn about her was learning about her mental health issues. So I delved into borderline personality disorder, um, postpartum psychosis, psychosis in general and OCD. Um, I think there's a lot of stigma around OCD and the fact that people don't quite understand it. I think a lot of people self-diagnose and say they have OCD if they like things orderly. And I'm like, that's not OCD. So my birth mother's OCD was religious paranoia. So the reason I was adopted point blank is she believed I was the spawn of Satan. So her whole pregnancy, she wouldn't touch her belly because she believed that she was transferring evil onto me. Um, She cleared out all the furniture in our apartment, set it alight in the middle of the street because she was cleansing the air of bad spirits Um, and a bunch of other things that are a bit too TMI for to go on YouTube. But that's the, the general gist of it. So that was another thing I had to get my head around of, you know, oh my God, am I actually the spawn of Satan? Like, oh. <laughs> am I evil? Oh, so you found this out from the letters. Did she say this? Um, this is all you... in the case files. Oh, okay. So, so when do you see the case files then? 18? When I dug them out, probably like oh. four, 14. So, oh. so when you when you go to adopt a child. And then looking all emo and everything in school and knowing in my head that my birth mother thought that I was the devil. I was, I was kind of like, oh my God, like... <laughs> It's all adding up. Am I actually going to walk into a church and burst into flames? When you adopt a child, you get something called a um, a lack report, looked after child report. And so you've decided you want to adopt, you've been approved, and then you'll start getting uh, things through email and it will be children's profiles Mm. and it will tell you about their background. And then when you express an interest, it'll be like a what they call it, an ele- elevator pitch, you know, like a little, just touch on it a little bit. Then when you express an interest in that child, then they'll send you the whole thing and it tells you everything about that that child. So um, once you've adopted the child, you'll have their lack medical, which is their medical report. So if they've been physically or sexually abused, you'll have all that information and you'll have all their background information so far as you can get you'll have all that as well. And also the social workers do something called a later life letter. So mm-hmm. the social worker will personally write to that child and say, these are the circumstances I found you in. It's when you're like 16, yeah, 17. Yeah, this is what your foster carer was like. You know, you were such a lovely baby, blah, 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 blah. And then that's for your foster care, the, the, the adopter to give to you when you're, you know, when they think you're mature enough. 
Mm. Yeah, that's that's a lot. Um, in terms of obviously without telling stories yourself, have you actually read some reports where you're like, yeah. oh my god, I, it's 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 like I'm not a shockable person. I'm not like because like I say, I've fostered and I've lived life, and so I'm not a shockable person, but. It's one of those ones when I was reading them, you know, me and my husband were sitting when we were deciding what child to look into adopting. We were sitting there with a glass of wine and I, I was crying. It's so... It, do you know what it is? It shows you the depths of human depravity, the depths of, um, like, what people go through. And that's why I said to you before that I don't want to be out here just, like, throwing birth parents under the bus, even though some of the things are terrible, because you get to find out the things that happened to them yeah, that exactly. led them that mm. to the point. And you think to yourself, if I was abused in that way or I was treated in that way or... So I'll give you a, a, um, something as well. So when you're fostering, you find that a lot of the children, a lot of the parents of the children that you're fostering, they were, they were ch um, children in the same local authority fostered themselves. So I'd have social workers saying to me, oh, is that so-and-so's mum? I was a social worker when she was 12. Do you, do you see what I mean? So the cycle just continues. It does. And um, the other thing that a lot of people, if they aren't aware of, is that in any local authority, say, for example, you have like 500 children who are being um, fostered. They come from a very small amount of families. So, you know, like where you have um, the police say, well, there's loads of burglaries happening, but it'll only be about f a handful of, bur you know, I mean, burglars who are doing those robberies. Same thing in foster care. That it's a very small amount of families that are having the children that they're neglecting. So they'll each have like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten children each. So it's it's very localised to a small demographic demographic of families in each area that are having these issues. Uh, as you're a human being as well, have you ever read a report and you're just like, you know what, this is a bit too much for me to take on? Like, because everyone has their boundaries. Like, for example, you are dating, I might look at a single mum and say, oh, she's amazing, she's great, but she has a child, I just can't bother. Just because I'm a human and I don't have to, so yes. I'm just not going to bother. So when you, when you do your, when you go through the adoption process, mm. you literally have, a, it's very analytical, they have a list of all the disabilities and all the things that you will and won't take on. And you literally sit and tick the list off of what you will and won't accept because they don't want to put a child with you only for you to turn around like a year later or so whatever. It's so, uh, yeah. too much for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, like, they'll say, will you accept Will you accept a uh, so if you're black? Will you accept a mixed race child? Will you accept a black child? Will you accept a child where the race is unclear? Will you accept a child with Down syndrome? Will you accept a child with, you know, a limb missing? It's very, very analytical. Crazy. So they that's why the process takes so long because they really want to delve deep into your. You don't want to make any mistakes. Yeah, like, yeah. This is it. You know, and sometimes mistakes are made because mm, you are only human. But. Yeah. Oh, feel free to disclose it if you don't. Obviously, this is more personal, so you don't have to. But did you ever have any tick boxes where you're like, actually, I just don't, would rather not deal with this like yours? Oh, yeah. I mean, we 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 had lo like loads of different conditions. We I didn't want a child, for instance, that was towards their end of life. I couldn't have managed with yeah, that. Yeah, it's hectic. But for me, that would just be too difficult. So everybody has their things that they can and can't deal with but also as well even when you tick boxes saying yes social workers might think no so you you may think you can deal with something but after the assessment's done they might think actually and it might be it might be something so simple as they don't think your house is mm. like oh big enough to yeah because yeah. like an adopted I don't, I don't know if it's still the case now but like adopted children when i was adopted couldn't share rooms yeah you need your own they need so your like room. my parents uh, I very quickly realised I was one of the only people in my school who was an only child and the only person in my family who was an only child other than my dad. Um, so I wanted a sibling. And my parents tried so hard to get me one. They had to get another house. When did they try and do this? Just before 2008. So they weren't able oh, to crisis. get another house. So they got me a dog instead, which was <laughs> great. I mean, he well, was a bit of a yappy little thing, yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know. Well, why do adopted kids have to have their own room? I don't know. I assume it's 
So, <laughs> so it's to do with. So, have you ever heard called a trauma bond? Your trauma bond. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, a lot of um, adopted children suffer from trauma bonds. Like siblings, they they suffer from trauma bonds. So, if you have. Um, say interfamily, say sexual abuse. Do you want to put a brother and a sister sibling in the same room together? Yeah, mad. So yeah, I didn't so, want to have to go there, so I'm glad that yeah, you did. So, <laughs> but but it could just be simple as not even that deep. Sometimes a lot of children who are um, uh, adopted have disabilities, autism, those type of, and it's just not feasible for them to. To, to share a room mm -hmm. and also as well um if the children aren't related and you've adopted several children you don't want them necessarily sharing a room yeah. so it's just f for safety and the other thing is as well what a lot of people don't realize is that a, you may adopt a child or foster a child that's been sexually abused but you may not know they've been sexually abused mm -hmm. and you'll be like how can you not know they've been sexually abused well if they're two how would you know what happened to them they they might come into care because they've been neglected, but you, you, don't not, you can't know for sure what really happened to that child. Sure. You can't know for sure. And also, if that child's been traumatised, you might find out later that that's happened, but you're not necessarily going to know from the start. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's just a precaution just to keep everybody safe and everybody like, yeah. happy because... Next thing you know, someone's done something and then you have to dissolve the placement. I mean, my, my, my adopted parents didn't know everything that had happened to me. Um, I only f really found out when I came into contact. Um, and I'm not going to disclose too much information, but a, a person who basically knew a lot about me mm. um, managed to find me and fill in a lot of the blanks. And there were a lot of things that I didn't know that social services didn't know yeah. and that my adopted parents mm. didn't know. So how did so, so how did they find, like they, they felt that they needed to tell you? Like how did they find you? Um, they actually had a dream and something in the dream told them to search for me and they found me. Oh, uh, okay. Really weird, but um, but really cool at the same but time. <laughs> so sorry, you, you were saying about the too much information. Were you th thankful that person Extremely. gave you? Oh, so you're actually thankful rather... Because I always talk about sometimes ignorance is bliss. So when it comes to something like, say, abuse, and I've spoken on before, sometimes the actual abuse itself isn't as damaging of the f as of the thought of you realising and talking to other people and realising that that lived-in experience isn't mm. normal, that it actually damages you. Like, for example, growing up, like, okay, let me, let me use something childish. Some people are really beaten by their parents in, in, in African households and they're actually getting whacked themselves. They're like, oh, this is how me and my siblings get disciplined. But what can actually mess people up is talking to their friends. They're like, wait, hold on, wait. My parents didn't mm -hmm. beat me with a belt till like my back was black and blue. And that can be actually the most damaging mm. part about it. So that's why I was kind of asking the question to you. So there was never an aspect of ignorance is bliss for you. You were happy that you had that information. No, I mean, because I've always known... Um for me, it's the the more I know, the better. Um, because there's never been that, there's never been that dynamic for me of hearing someone say something and me realizing, oh, I'm different because I've always known I'm different. Mm -hmm. um, but I do agree with you that that can be very damaging. I just, I can't relate. I, I really can't. I'm so used to, <coughs> to being different. And you ha you you kind of have to know why you were removed because I just there's no child ever where the adoptive parent says, well, you were adopted and you were removed, and they just say, okay, cool. Yeah. The next question is, well, why, why was I removed? Mm -hmm. So you can't really, you, I, like we talked about before about the hole that needs to be filled. You really need to tell them why, because it's just, it's such a big thing. Like I say, to remove a child from a, their birth parent, you, 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 you kind of need a good, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You kind of need a good reason why your whole life was upended because you got to remember, a lot of children are not just being removed from their birth parent, but from their siblings as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's deep. So you, you've got to have a good reason to do that. Like I, I obviously, my, my biological father has two children and I've grown up an only child and I spoke about how, how lonely that was at times. What was another layer to that was, okay, I'm an only child. All my friends are on holiday. It's summer holidays. So I've got no one to play with. And I know somewhere out there, there's a brother and sister. Is it easy for parents to put, I'll make this my last question, is it, is it easy for parents to put their kids up for adoption? No. It's, it's extremely hard, actually. So so what happens is you'll ring up social services and say, I want to put my child up for adoption. and say, okay, we'll come and see you in a 
maybe tomorrow or whatever or whenever it is. And they'll delay. And the reason why they delay is because what people don't understand is, is pregnancy isn't just about producing a child it makes the mother so they want to delay so the hormones kick in Post and you get, you get the bond yeah. with the child so by the time you you actually end up handing the baby over to anyone they might have learned you, you how don't to want cope. to mm. you don't but what if you do something nuts like if you don't come pick him up i'm leaving him by the m25 yeah mm. then mm. They, they they would probably put support in for you mm. and increase health visit visits and those type of things but it's the, Hollywood has ruined adoption, to be honest, and fostering because people think it's like you just sort of turn up outside an orphanage, you know what I mean, and put the baby on the steps and then off you go. Um, but it's not really like that. I mean, obviously... That's what I thought it was like, oh, by the way, yeah, I'm, I'm not really feeling yeah. this. But like I say, majority of children do not get um, relinquished. Vast majority of the children in the UK, anyway, are being removed due to neglect or abuse mm. or you know, being abandoned. So I, th I think the number's like 2% or something. Yeah. Don't quote me on that. We need the fact checkers. But it's mm. such a tight... I mean, to get a relinquished baby is like... I'm an, I'm, a, I'm an exception to the rule. I'm extremely lucky. But like you said, I'm white. I'm a girl. Chances are I was going to be one of them to get adopted. And, and you're that's, nine months as well. So that's the harsh reality. And I'm blessed. Yeah, most, really blessed. Mostly it's police and social workers and screaming and... Yeah. You're not taking my child. It, that that's how it goes, you know, mm. and it's it's unfortunate. But like I say, it's it, it's it, it's it's pain for everybody. It's a it's a mm. loss for everyone. So just to round off quickly, yeah. um, w is there anything that from your experiences, both of you, that would need to change to better the whole situation? Things that could improve, or do you believe it works the way it should work? I've, I've uh, per personally, from my point of view, uh, as uh, as an adopter, I think f social services need to start working for the time scales for the child and not for the birth parent, because they get a lot of time to to turn things around. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a chance to try and turn things around, but if you're if you're if you're two, if you if you're two when you get adopted, right, that's 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 half your life you've been waiting for a family and that we know from research the earlier you get adopted the earlier you have a stable home the better you are oh, so nice. every year we wait for the birth parent to get clean to stop you know being on road or whatever they're doing that child is waiting you, you do you know what i mean for and they might have had two or three foster placements in that time so I think we need to reevaluate that. Yes, we give birth parents a chance to turn their lives around, but we make it clear to them we're working on child's time scales and not yours. Mm. You know, and this child hasn't got four years. Yeah, you, you know what I mean for for you to get your stuff together. Yeah, I I I just have to agree. Um, yeah, like the the social workers need to be more ensuring that things are done a bit quicker obviously i'm like i said i'm an exception to the rule things were done fairly quickly um but you know from things i've read they gave my birth mother chances after you know stuff i've read that i've been like i wouldn't have given another chance if i'm being really honest mm. and like you say the longer you're waiting that's more trauma stacking up as well being without state stability especially at that age when you're trying to form and develop is trauma. And like, you know, stress really affects you. So I, you, you, you get problems from that. Your immune system's developing. I have a terrible immune system. When, if, if you look at a photo from when I was first placed in foster care to like a month later, the mm. first picture, I, I really look damaged. I look like I've got third degree burns all over my body, but it's just yeah. eczema. I, Where does I, eczema come from? It's inflammation of the immune system. Why does that happen? Because stress gets stored I, I in the immune system. That. You, you, I've got friends who've adopt, uh, fostered and you literally will have pictures of the child when they first came. It's not nice. And pictures when they get adopted and they look completely different children. I, it, I look like two different children and it's only a month apart. So mm. within a month of being in stability... My skin is clear. I'm smiling. In the first picture, I look afraid and I'm red and inflamed head to toe. Have you seen the pictures of the children's brains when 
So you have two children's brains. One's of a child who's been neglected and abused, and one's not. Yeah, my sister's my she, she's a, she did um p a masters in pediatric nursing, so she was telling me about all the facts. Yeah, because when I went to, when I go to obviously I'll round up now, but when I would go to Nigeria, I actually visited visit an orphanage, mm. and in Nigeria, they're like, yeah, it's it's, it's bleak. Yeah, <laughs> it's really it's really not nice. Um, well, 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 thank you a lot for coming on anyway. Thank you for having us. Thank you for. Is there any like me. stuff that you're doing? If you want to plug socials, you want to say follow me on. Um, can I just say, if anyone's interested in adoption, um, Action for Children are a great um, organisation. Or ring your local authority. And also, if you've been adopted, if you're an adoptee, um, please seek help if you're struggling. Don't you're not alone. You can go back to the local authority where you were adopted from and get help. I have to agree. Um, do all of that, but things take time. I'm still on a waiting list that I've been on for a long time to try and relinquish all of those records. Um, but seek out other adoptees. And if anyone's watching who's adopted and you're struggling or you just want to talk to someone else who knows what it's like, it's kind of a supernatural understanding when you meet someone else who's adopted. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Christine Grace Smith. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. You know what to do, like, share, subscribe. <laughs>